Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Ivy Love. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Center on Education and Labor here at New America, and I'll be guiding you through our event today. We're so grateful to have all of you here with us uh, for this event on Community College Baccalaureate or CCB programs. So today you're going to hear a presentation on our brand new national look at community college bachelor's degrees, followed by a panel discussion with program leaders and faculty to share their experiences on the ground in CCB programs with students. Um, we're excited to offer this event to you and we hope that you find it helpful. And I wanna invite each of you, uh, as you just heard in the recorded entry, um, to share any questions that you may have that arise throughout the event. Um, please feel very free, you're all invited to share. We want this to be a discussion. Um, we'll do our best to address as many of those questions as we can during the question and answer time at the end of the event. You can also get a hold of us and connect with other attendees via Twitter. You saw the hashtag community colleges, so please feel free to engage there as well. Um, we'd be more than happy to chat after the event um, on Twitter or uh, via email and contact us. So finally, I want to offer a huge thanks to our funders for this work, the Joyce Foundation, ECMC, and the Ascendium Education Group. Their totally unwavering support and engagement just means so much to us. And in many ways, we couldn't do this work without them. Beyond their financial support for this work, our amazing program officers have sharpened our thinking and encouraged us along the way. So today we're really proud to be able to share what we've been able to do thanks to their generosity and their confidence in our team. So with that, um, let's just move right along. I want to pass the mic over to Dr. Deborah Bragg for some opening remarks. Thank you, Ivy. It's always a, a pleasure to work with our colleagues at New America. Um, I am uh, really, really pleased to be with you today and to have an opportunity to introduce some of the folks who are responsible for this work. But let me just, uh, before I do that, recognize that we formed a partnership in early 2018 uh, between Bragg and Associates, New America, University of Washington, um, and the Community College Baccalaureate Association. So this is a, a continuing labor of love for all of us. Um, this work could not have been done without uh, the hard work of many individuals. And I want to recognize those who contributed to the creation of this brand new data set on community college baccalaureate programs. Um, that group includes, of course, Mary Alice McCarthy, who leads CELNA, the Center on Labor in New America, Educational Labor at New America, um, Iris Palmer and Ivy Love, who you just met, as well as a couple of super talented interns who were at New America this year, and that's Rebecca Haig, who was who is at Princeton, and uh, Yoon Chow, who's at Berkeley. I also want to recognize my colleague Elizabeth Meza at the University of Washington and two interns who are working on their doctorates in community college leadership, Tammy Napientech and Ellen Wasserman, who are at the New Jersey City University. And finally, uh, one of my former students who graduated at the University of Illinois, Stephanie O'Leary. Um, so this is an incredible team. Uh, and it could have never been done uh, without all uh, hands on deck. And so I thank them. And I um, also want to thank my colleague, Angela Kersenbrock, who leads the Community College Baccalaureate Association. And I think she has a few words for you as well. Thank you, Deb. And thank you, Ivy. And thank you, Mary Alice, um, for all the work that you're doing. Uh, this, you know, the saying, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it certainly takes a village to do the kind of work that you all have done and what we all continue to do for community college baccalaureates. You know, as uh, CCBA is very fond of saying, we're, uh, we're all in, all focused on having community college students have the opportunity to obtain a baccalaureate degree that's workforce focused um, and that provides a family sustaining wage. Over the past year or so, we've had so many new um, states come on board and also existing states expand the ability of their community colleges to offer baccalaureate degrees. Um, as a practitioner, someone who is at the community colleges writing baccalaureate degrees, 
it was really important that you could find some folks who had already done this, who already paved the way. And this is what your research is, um, is really all about, paving the way, showing folks how to do this, um, maybe without some of the obstacles um, they have faced. So your work really is gonna impact, you know, the next 10, 20 years in community colleges. And we're so excited to be a part of that. Um, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't put a plug in for uh, CCBA's annual conference this February. Go to our website. We hope that you join us where this conversation will continue. So Ivy, thank you for inviting CCBA to be part of this. Um, we're excited and honored to share in the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. We really appreciate you and we appreciate CCBA. Um, CCBA is such a great community, so it's always really great to be able to partner with you. Thank you so much. Um, so now it is time for our presentation, looking at our new inventory of CCB institutions and programs. So I wanna welcome back Dr. Bragg and Mr. Tim Harmon to share their research presentation. Thank you, Ivy. Um, before I dive in, I, I, uh, I want to take a minute to introduce my colleague, Timothy Harmon, Tim. Um, Tim and I have worked together for many, many years um, and have really loved this opportunity to dive into the world of community college baccalaureate degrees. Uh, Tim has deep experience in workforce development and development of career pathways at the state and federal level. And many of you probably know his work. So it's just a real thrill for, to present with him today. And I wanna recognize his great work. Um, so I'm gonna say, let's kick it off with uh, the slides. So, uh, as any uh, good researcher would. I want to tell you just a little bit about our, our methods. And I won't spend too much time on this. Always happy to talk about how did you figure out uh, what you're sharing today. I think it's particularly important in a field that's so new, um, like the community college baccalaureates. Um, so we did a lot of things to get to today. One of the most important first steps we took, it, it was to look at iPads and the Carnegie basic classification. And we're interested in finding institutions that confer baccalaureate degrees, but retain their um, classification as a predominant associate granting institution, essentially a community college. So that is a, it's a bedrock of, um, the numbers that we're sharing today. We started this work uh, about 10 months ago uh, with that iPad search. And again, shout out to Elizabeth Meza at the University of Washington for helping us uh, get started in that work. And we repeated that analysis again in October, knowing that the data could have been refreshed. We didn't actually find many changes in the institutional classification between March and October, but we want you to know we were thorough and updated our work. I'll say a little bit more about that classification in a minute. Um, from there, we then uh, took what we found, the states that identified institutions in these with this classification, and we went um, to state agencies, to uh, higher education systems within states and to institutions themselves uh, to see if they themselves still see themselves as a community college baccalaureate granting institution. So that painstaking work took a while. We, con we did contact all, uh, all states, including states that we didn't find institutions to ensure that there might not be something happening that we didn't know of didn't know about. So um, we're pretty thorough there. We also have a, a extensive, probably the most extensive collection of legislative uh, policies, rules, and regulations in the country. So we gathered all of that information and used that as a double check uh, as we talk to states and systems about what they're doing. The probably the most painstaking work that we did is once we found institutions, we went to websites and we analyzed the websites 
of every potential community college baccalaureate program we could find, every baccalaureate de uh, uh, degree conferred by uh, the community colleges in our list. So that was uh, the most extensive and many of the people I thanked a few minutes ago were part of that work. And then throughout all of this, um, we had a process for uh, really engaging one another in figuring out if we think what we're doing makes sense. So a cross team validation process. And I will tell you that we tended toward being conservative. So if we didn't know or we disagreed, we tended not to count um, either the institution or the program. So it's possible that our numbers are a bit low. It's also possible that we've made some decisions that you wouldn't have made or others wouldn't have made. Um, but I do thank um, everyone who is involved and also send you to our paper uh, that's first authored by Ivy that gives you a little bit of more information about our methods. So I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm just going to um, say something about this classification. Carnegie's basic classification did recognize in 2018 that there are traditionally what we call two-year colleges or community colleges that confer baccalaureate degrees. And they created two categories, this baccalaureate associates dominant, which means an institution gives some baccalaureates, but it is an associate dominant institution. And then another classification, the baccalaureate mixed mission. So as you can see here, most of the institutions that we count are the baccalaureate associates dominant. Some of the institutions, the ones that are in the, the red pie, are institutions that consider themselves mixed mission, uh, which essentially means that they're moving toward more of a balance between associates and baccalaureates. Maybe they're not there, but may tend to move there. And I thought you might find it interesting that 11 of those mixed mission institutions are in Florida which is the state that has now fully scaled up to all 28 community colleges. So time in this, um, in, in this exercise does seem to matter. Um, five of the institutions that are in that uh, 24 are also in Georgia and have been conferring baccalaureate degrees for a while. So there does seem to be some movement toward that mixed mission over time. But I'd also point out that we, uh, we identified 23 additional community colleges that are still associate colleges. They've not been reaccredited. They aren't officially identified by Carnegie yet uh, as a baccalaureate um, associates dominant, but we anticipate that that number um, is going to be added to the 94. So that's, that's going to be a pretty big number. Um, let's go to the next slide then. So you can see the current map of the United States. We now count 24 uh, states in, in our count. And you can see that huge swath of um, uh, blue-green states through the West, which is where we've really seen the expansion of these degrees over the last uh, few years. We have very few states, as you can see up in the Northwest, the one that is counted is Vermont and Vermont uh, Technical College is a baccalaureate awarding institution. Um, but the, there, there's uh, lots that I could say here. Um, one has already been alluded to in the last five years, we've seen seven states that have authorized uh, baccalaureate degrees to be conferred by uh, community colleges, sometimes only one, like in Idaho, but in other states, Wyoming, Oregon, um, Arizona, Ohio, those states did not put limits on the number of institutions that can confer. And so while some of those states are not yet conferring, uh, most are uh, on some level, although certainly um, not scaled up. I also want to mention, I think, an important point, um, and that is that we are not including, although we want to recognize 
that there are also baccalaureate associates dominant uh, tribal colleges. About half of the tribal colleges are um, fit in this category and also uh, US territory. So this extends beyond uh, the 50 states to, um, to other parts uh, of our country. So I would again point you as I, as I move to the next slide to our paper, which actually shows you a moving map so you can see when states have joined into these 24 states. This slide um, is, is a little um, busy, but let me just share with you that uh, we want to point out a few things, things, using, using, using that, that, you know, most of the states are not um, scaled up in the sense that all institutions are doing this. And I believe that's intentional. Um, the point of these degrees is that they meet student needs and workforce needs, and they develop out of that rich and important conversation between colleges, the students who might not otherwise have an opportunity to pursue a baccalaureate degree, and a need for uh, workers, employees, and the creation of career paths that not only create new jobs, but create advancement. And one of the reasons you see such differences in um, the approved programs is because partly time, uh, some of these are newer states, but part of it are choices that are being made uh, within states to allow particular institutions or groups of institutions to confer, confer baccalaureate degrees based on the need um, that is uh, presented to them. And so uh, with that, we see a, a few states, uh, some are not very bit, many community colleges, but some are quite large. Florida's entire 28 uh, colleges, 29 of the 34 in Washington now confer uh, baccalaureate degrees and uh, and some of the others are moving in that direction. So it's a it's a rich and complex environment for the baccalaureate degrees um, and something that uh, many factors contribute to the decisions that states are making. And that's probably uh, the most important point I I need to make. Let me move to the next slide and just kind of uh, review the numbers for you then. The 24 states, seven of those states have, have been um, conferring in the last five years or approved to confer. There are 41 institutions that have come on board in the last five years. So that's the, the pie chart you saw. And then 132 baccalaureate degree programs have been added in the last five years. So the programs lag the identification of institutions by just a bit. Um, but these are the numbers that um, are in our data set and we're happy to share. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Tim Harmon to, to tell you more. Thanks, Deborah. And let me say too, what, what a thrill it has been to work with you and all the members of the, of the team that's been working on this project. I'm a relative newcomer to the issue of Community College Baccalaureate. And so I have learned a lot from, from you and from the others that have been working on this. So it's been a great learning experience for me. And my, my part of this is to maybe talk a little bit more about the specific degree programs and types of degrees and give a little insight maybe into the directions that we see for the future. So if we could look at the, the next slide. So, um, this chart uh, is a really interesting one to me. I mean, it shows the CCB programs by the type of degree which graduates may earn. Um, and in looking at the um, 559 degree programs, which we found, we, we found 13 unique degree types, which was more than I expected to find. Uh, but the five most common of those are shown on this slide with a kind of other unknown category thrown in there to capture the very rare ones that we found. So some, some legislation limits um, CCB 
uh, to a certain type of credential, a certain type of degree. Uh, for example, uh, Washington, Oregon, uh, and Ohio limit authorization of CCDs to some form of an applied bachelor's degree. Um, where some programs are considered applied based on the field of study, in other cases, the bachelor's degree itself must be a Bachelor of Applied Science or a Bachelor of Applied Technology. So the BAS or the BAT. Uh, so since some of the most common uh, CCB areas of study uh, build on the applied associate degrees. Um, it makes sense that you know the BAS and BAT would be the most common among the CCB programs. Um, now, Bachelor of Arts degrees are there, but they're fairly rare among CCB programs, and they tend to be offered uh, by a handful of CCB conferring institutions that offer a larger array of bachelor's degrees. Um, I'm assuming and possibly across those more mixed mission uh, uh, institutions that have kind of have a foot in both worlds. Um, I wanna focus a little bit on the Bachelor of Science in Nursing, uh, which you see there on the slide. Um, it is a common CCB program and interest in increasing these programs nationwide appears to be quite high. Uh, of the many possible fields in which um, these programs are offered. The one uh, most frequently mentioned is the BSN or Bachelor of Science in Nursing degree. So historically degree programs have served as the most common pathway into careers as a registered nurse. Yet many registered nurses who enter the profession with an associate degree, you know, they wish to go on and earn their bachelor's degree after licensure to increase salary, access management opportunities, et cetera. Um, Colorado and Texas stand out as states authorizing the BSN degree programs and seeing the sizable scale up in community colleges in recent years. Also, Ohio uh, is the most recent state to pass legislation specifically authorizing community colleges to confer the uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Um, next slide, please. So, First, we looked at degree types, and now we want to look at program categories. Um, and so what, um, in addition to categorizing our 559 programs by the type of degree, we use the information we obtained about each program uh, to assign a classification of instructional program code at the six digit level. Uh, now in this chart, and we did that, uh, you know, mostly by looking at the materials that the colleges provided on their on their uh, student facing websites, and we had other information available to us. So this chart here um, indicates the most common broad fields of study using the first two digits of the program CIP code. Um, most CCB authorizing legislation limits these programs to those that demonstrate local labor market need, as Deborah mentioned, often. This legislation places parameters also around duplication of program offerings with public universities in the same service area. So it would, for instance, prohibit that. Um, CCBs most often exist in technical fields, uh, frequently those in which College Act already operates in social degree program, as I mentioned. And nursing, again, is very popular. And, we, and there's so many uh, CCBs in nursing that combining them with the other you know, healthcare programs under you know, category two digit 51 would, would obscure their prevalence. So we, we've shown them separately here in their own 51.3801 category. And um, uh, so several states, as I mentioned, have passed legislation authorizing this. And so we expect to see more of these in the future. Um, now let's, uh, well, let's go to the next slide. I think that's probably the best thing. Okay, so the, this uh, chart, uh, focuses on uh, the most common two-digit CIP fields. It's the same frame of reference, but it looks at just those new CCP programs that came online in the last five years. So we, we wanted to do this because we were interested in seeing whether or not there was a lot, there was a big difference between what was happening most recently and what has been happening historically uh, with uh, community college baccalaureate programs in terms of the program categories, CIP program categories. And actually, um, that pattern looks fairly similar. We didn't really see a big difference there. Um, 
health professions, you know, category 51 is the most common in particular nursing, as you mentioned, shown separately also in this slide, with 20 new nursing programs in the last five years and 24 other health profession occupations. Uh, by the way, the other, other than nursing, the most common new health program is uh, respiratory therapy, uh, which uh, makes sense, I guess, because credential requirements and employer expectations are changing with respect to that occupation. Um, associate degree programs continue to prepare people for occupational licensure in, in respiratory therapy, but only uh, but in the accrediting body for respiratory therapy, as you may know, is no longer allowing new associate degree programs to be implemented. So only programs at the bachelor's level. So that's a shift in credential requirement that's happening. So given that, you know, we expect to see more respiratory therapy programs authorized by through the CCB mechanism in the future, as well as other kinds of allied health programs. Um, business programs, category 52 is a close second to healthcare, followed by education, computer information sciences, and engineering technologies. Those are sort of the top ones. Uh, the most common new uh, business program and looking through the more detailed version of this is business administration management and operations. Um, early childhood education and training is the most common new program in the education category. And computer and information system security is the most common new program in the computer and information sciences category. Uh, I'm really happy about that as someone who depends on access to the internet to do things like this. Um, next slide. So um, this, this is an interesting chart. Th this chart illustrates the mix among those common fields of study uh, that we mentioned uh, in the five states with the highest number of active CCB programs. So not the, you know, not the five most recent states, but the five states with the, the largest number of active programs. And uh, so these are five states that have all authorized community college baccalaureate programs for a relatively long period of time. In fact, the, the latest state among these five to first authorize CCB programs is Washington in 2005. So these states have all been in the business of CCB for a while, um, and they have lots of programs. Um, now, the areas of study shown in this chart are common across the states, that, but the proportions, as you can see, vary. Um, indicating perhaps how the need for CCB programs in particular field may vary from state to state and location to location. Um, and uh, we see in this slide though, a substantial state to state variation in particularly in nursing, other healthcare professions and education, which possibly is reflective of you no know, demand in those areas, but may also be reflective of varying policy environments across the states and the the ability to offer things like that, you know, a BSN, et cetera. Um, the chart of that blue category at the bottom, the STEM category. So we combine several CIP code areas to create a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics category, uh, giving, you know, longstanding interest in, in STEM and, you know, our research that looks at STEM CCB programs. Um, and these programs account for about 20 to 30 percent of the CCB programs in the five states. Likewise, there's a range of programs and concentrations exist in the CCB business programs. Uh, because knowledge and skills from a bachelor's program in business can support initial employment, career advancement, and entrepreneurship, these programs are common among CCBs. Florida, for instance, the state with the most programs and the longest history of CCBs, Organizational management programs comprise the highest share of graduates of any CCB programs in the 2018-19 period, which is the most recent year for which data is available. The uh, CCB programs in education, which support local residents' preparation for the teaching profession fit well with the community college mission to support the education and training of those in nearby communities. Um, early childhood education programs that build on associate degrees are common among CCB teacher preparation pathways. Uh, states like Florida have many teacher preparation programs across a range of student ages and subject matter. Uh, so uh, just to sort of, sort of close out this part of, of our presentation, uh, I'd just like to say that based on our uh, examination of these data um, and, and sort of what's happening, what our knowledge is about what's happening in the states, we, we expect uh, more institutions and programs to come online soon. Um, 
as, as Deborah alluded to. So for example, you know, Arizona and Oregon are two of the states among the seven new states authorizing in the last five years. And they're currently working on their program approval and application processes. Uh, so they're you know, brand new. So there's a lot of potential there. Ohio, another example of one of the seven new states authorizing in the last five years has recently enacted a new law in nursing, as I mentioned. Um, and so we expect to see you know, uptake for that, of course. And then in addition, four states that, are, that already allow widespread conferral of the CCB, which some of which you see on this slide, uh, have enacted new laws recently opening the door to more institutions and more programs. And that's California, Colorado, Texas, and Washington. So considering these, all of these developments, we, we, we feel it's highly likely that there will be another significant jump in um, CCB availability during the next five years, just even just focusing on those institutions and programs within these existing states, and not even counting any additional states that might, uh, that might you know, begin to authorize the, the, the CCB. So anyway, the bottom line is that uh, there's substantial potential, we feel, for scaling up CCB programs in the states which already authorize it, and this could be a key feature of the next phase of CCB implementation. So, um, in closing, um, questions about the landscape of community college baccalaureate programs require accurate data uh, to begin to find answers. So this inventory of CCB institutions and programs, we, we feel, presents a first good step toward assessing the types of degrees, the program areas, and geographic concentration. So these data hopefully make it possible for new analyses on CCBs and how states and colleges are using these programs to address student demand and community and labor market needs. And I will hand it back. Thank you so much to both of you um, for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, so I now want to invite um, Dr. Jonathan Turk from St. Louis University to offer some comments and questions to our presenters about the inventory and our findings. So the mic is all yours. Sounds good. Thank you, Ivy. Um, so thanks to, to both Deborah and Tim for that really great presentation and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as, as Ivy mentioned, my name is Jonathan Turk. I'm an assistant professor of higher education here at St. Louis University in Missouri. Um, my areas of research are really focused on community colleges, um, community college student success, and the intersections of state and federal policy and community colleges. Um, in addition, I've also spent the past handful of years really focused on data and data systems in higher education. So, you know, think about iPads, think about analytics, think about the NCES sample surveys and, you know, other things like that. So I'm very happy to be here this afternoon um, and to have the opportunity to discuss just how cool these data really are. Um, for those of you who are wondering, cool is the uh, proper academic term for it, um, but they are, they're just really, really cool. So I wanna begin by just talking a little bit about you know, what gap this new data set uh, is really filling. Our presenters did a good job highlighting some key examples of that, um, but I'd like to emphasize a couple of additional points and offer a little bit more reflection. So you know, when we think about higher education data at the institution level, it's hard not to think about iPads, right? Um, iPads as a data source is really rich and can tell us a lot, but it, it also has its limitations. So one of the first gaps that I think these new data really help us um, fill or begin filling, you know, unlike iPads, this data set can tell us the type of degree um, institutions are awarding. So think about Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, uh, Bachelor of Applied Science, rather than just the, the level, Associate, Bachelor, Master's, and so forth. Um, and it can also, this new data set can also help us better understand the relationship between different degree levels at a specific institution. So let, let me unpack that a little bit. So why, why is that even important? What am I even really talking about, right? So degree types, whether it be at the associate degree level or at the bachelor's level, may have different signaling value in the market or may have ramifications for continued educational pathways. So, you know, for example, at the associate level, we're often comfortable with this idea that the AA, the associate in arts degree, is the premier transfer preparation degree while pathways to the baccalaureate for AAS uh, degree holders may have more barriers. Before this data set, we couldn't examine what share of CCB programs were awarding BAs versus bachelors of applied sciences, for example. 
Um, I know just for me, I was a little surprised to see just how many Bachelor of Science degree programs uh, were present at the CCBs um, in, this, in this data set. Um, so I think this information will be important for researchers to examine whether different CCB uh, degree types have different values in the labor market, you know, once we kind of hold constant specific programmatic areas, um, but also how different CCB programs might ultimately feed into to education beyond the bachelor's degree. I mean, I firmly believe that no degree pathway should be a dead end. And so how do we need to be thinking about CCBs or how might different CCB degree types impact graduate opportunities, graduate enrollment opportunities into the future? But stepping back just for a moment, you know, this data set is also helping us understand how some CCB programs are embedding sub-baccalaureate credentials into their baccalaureate programs. It's that kind of stackable model. It's helping us understand uh, which types of programs and at what kinds of institutions faculty are making these design choices. So I think this information will be particularly useful for faculty who are just beginning to develop baccalaureate programs um, at community colleges, but also poses an interesting research question about the retention and bachelor's degree completion rates in similar programs that do and do not offer, for instance, an associate degree in route. So, you know, another observation. So I think this, this new data set really helps us develop a clear understanding not only of the spread of CCB programs across the country and within states, but also their representation within the mix of programs offered at a single institution. You know, so much of our understanding of, of higher education comes from data sets that begin the descriptions of colleges and universities as either being less than two year, two year or four year institutions. You know, this level of classification is based on the length of the longest degree offered at an institution, not necessarily the predominant award. So, you know, I think the one of the classic examples is taking like Miami-Dade College, for, for example, in Florida. So in 2019-2020, only 7% of all of the credentials awarded at Miami-Dade College were bachelor's degrees. The remaining credentials were associate degrees and certificates, sub-baccalaureate certificates. Miami-Dade is a four-year institution under this classification. And I mean this in, in no negative sense. Miami-Dade College is a fabulous institution. But is Miami-Dade College the same type of institution as the University of Florida, which awarded virtually no associate degrees in 2019-2020? You know, stepping away from iPads for a second, many on this call and certainly around DC, I spent the last seven years of my career working professionally in, in DC, are very familiar with, uh, with another higher education data source, the National Post-Secondary Student Aid Study, or NIPSAS. You know, NIPSAS provides us a nationally representative sample of students enrolled in higher education so that we can explore their background characteristics, some of their educational experiences, and how they finance their education. It's also the base of, uh, for two other studies that look specifically at beginning students and, and at students who complete bachelor's degrees. So NIPSAS and its family of suites um, are often used to, to inform federal policy decisions. However, that, that representative, remember I said that nationally representative sample, that sample that undergirds NIPSAS is based on a two-stage design, where ultimately the first stage is to select institutions based on that sampling frame of less than two-year, two-year, and four-year institutions. So where do community college baccalaureate institutions fit in? They fit in that four-year, and that may not be the best sampling frame when we're trying to develop really representative data for students at these types of institutions as well. So, you know, what is, I guess, what is my point with all of this, right? So I think first, this new data set helps us paint a clearer picture to the mix of programs being offered at community colleges, uh, CCBs. It will help us and others better understand how baccalaureate programs are being strategically deployed at community colleges. It also shows us that authorizing CCBs does not mean that these institutions suddenly forget their mission to also provide education at the sub-baccalaureate level and prepare students for transfer. It shows us that in a time of rapid change and diffusion of these CCB programs, the time lag that's associated with iPads anywhere from a year to two years reporting is, isn't going to give us the data that we need to know when we need it. This is a rapidly changing environment. You know, and, and finally, the, the data set and I think really CCBs more broadly prove, in my mind anyway, 
that the way we classify and the way we talk about colleges and universities is outdated and really needs refinement. Two-year, four-year, these classifications are gross oversimplifications in the era of the CCB. We need to think about new ways to describe and classify institutions that takes into better account their actual missions. I mean, I think if you talk to any community college president in the country, they will help happily walk you through, uh, they will happily walk you through their mission, uh, what that mission means to them, their institution and their local community. Adding a small number of bachelor's degree programs does not negate that mission. It doesn't, it doesn't negate that. It just provides another mechanism by which they can fulfill those, those really truly unique missions in our higher education system. So from a data perspective, I really think we need to do a better job to, to capture that. And I think these kind of exercises, these kinds of new data sets are, are, can really help provide the, the, the framework with which to improve those larger, um, those larger data systems. So those are just some of my, some of my thoughts. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing yeah, your comments. Much, much appreciated. Um, great. So now it's time to move from our presentation time into our panel. So I would love to welcome here with me um, Professor Sinena Varendra from Skagit Valley College in Washington and Dr. Emma Miller from South Texas College. Um, we're so glad to have both of you here with us um, for this panel discussion. Really grateful for your participation. Um, I wonder if we could just kick off with some short introductions of yourself and a little bit about your role at your college. Um, so Dr. Miller, could we start with you? Sure. Good afternoon, Ivy. Thank you so much uh, for granting us this opportunity to speak about our programs at uh, South Texas College. Um, like you said, I'm Dr. Miller. I uh, oversee currently the Organizational Leadership Program, which is a BAS degree. And so um, at the same time, I've had the opportunity to kind of oversee the rest of the bachelor programs as well. Thank you so much. Per Professor Verendra, do you want to introduce yourself and share a bit about what's going on at Skagit Valley? Sure, I'd be delighted to. So my name is uh, Sunaina Varendra. Um, I normally would spell it out because I pronounce it phonetically because it's 15 letters and that gets complicated sometimes. Um, I have the great honor to teach in our Bachelor in Applied Management program at Skagit Valley College. Um, it's a program that's near and dear to my heart because it represents um, the background that I come from in that I spent 25 years in the corporate world before transitioning into a higher education world. So it's really been an opportunity to bring those learnings into a, a classroom setting. And I'm also working with our instructional leadership on uh, infusing the same type of um, philosophy that we're using in our bachelor's uh, applied management program to our other BAS degrees, our other bachelor degrees. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, so I want to ask now a little bit about institutional rationale for a CCB. We, we've just heard about the expanse, the different types of programs. You're both involved in business programs, which are the most common program area. Could you say a little bit about um, how these programs started and, and what the reason was that the college saw for implementing a bachelor's program. Um, Professor Brenda, could we maybe start with you this time? Sure. Um, so, you know, it, it's uh, picking up on what, what Jonathan was talking about with a community college having a mission um, and the link that our college saw to bachelor's degrees being a very natural extension. So we have a, a mission like so many other schools that are centered on student success and student achievement and promoting equitable and thriving communities around us. And as we looked at what we were doing as an institution in serving students with associate degrees, we realized that that, that was kind of that terminal pathway for many of our students. It was a terminal pathway. So bachelor's degrees and introducing a portfolio of bachelor's degrees for Skagit just became a natural extension of or natural fit of how we fulfill the mission. Dr. Miller, how about South Texas? Could you tell us a little bit about how these programs came to be? Yes, actually, they began uh, probably back in 2003 when the legislature looked into uh, how, giving more opportunities to students um, in their communities. And so um, Texas had an initiative called 60 by 30, where they're trying to reach by 2030 to have 60% of all Texans that are within the age groups of 25 to 34 
to have some type of certificate or associate or baccalaureate degree, some kind of educational degree. And so as a result of that, that is why uh, we were identified as one of three community colleges to be able to offer uh, baccalaureate degrees. And so since then, and actually until present day, we're the only ones that have been allowed to grant up to five baccalaureate programs at our college. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, we've talked some about, um, you know, at the, at the program level, but I want to dig into what the program actually looks like. Um, one of the things that we know from some previous research that our team has done is that uh, we know CCD programs serve a high share of historically underserved students, um, that the average age in the two states where we where we have these data in Washington and Florida, students are in their early 30s on average. So how do you create a bachelor's program that works well with their lives and considers their goals and needs and experiences holistically? What does that look like? Um, can we go to Dr. Miller first. Sure, Ivy. So basically, when they develop these programs, as you know, in community colleges, we're known for workforce programs, right? Uh, so with that in mind, this is how they created the baccalaureate degrees with a workforce in mind. So we basically have, just like an associate's degree program, we have advisory committees and those advisory committees dictate to us how, you know, what the curriculum should be, what does the market look like, what kind of skills our students should have in each of the programs. And so based on that is how we designed our courses. And so that students, once they graduate, they're able to, you know, be gainfully employed quickly. And so that allows us to just not only provide with the types of traditional courses, but we also offer competency-based education, which we'll, you know, we can get into a little more uh, into one of the later questions that you'll have. Yeah, Professor Barendra, I would love to hear from you. What, what does this, the baccalaureate program look like? So I'm, I'm going to talk specifically about my program, which is the Applied Management degree at Skagit. And this, this was um, a program that when we, when we designed it, one of the things that we realized was that the number one thing we were competing against in terms of getting students to be able to attend our program was their lives, right? So what I mean by this is that all of our, almost all my students work, almost all of them have other things going on in their lives, and their time at, as a college student is just a teeny tiny fraction. So what I've got to be able to do to deliver an experience that it, that will help students, students get through the experience, but also um, make it something that they feel is worth the time, sacrificing time with their family, time away from you know, all the other many demands, is to, is to ensure that I have a program that um, is relevant and that it's accessible. And the way we did this for this particular, for this my particular program is by going with a cohort model. So it sounds a little you know, counterintuitive. How does a cohort model work with, um, uh, you know, with, with making a program accessible. So this is because what we have done is really limit the amount of time students have to spend in seat. It's independent learning. It is really structured around how the workplace operates in that we give you the support and then we say now work in project teams to come up with solutions and with answers. You know, so there's a hybrid structure that's involved. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm focusing now is how do we take all the learnings that we had of teaching through COVID and bring that into an, into an educational environment where I'm preparing my, my students to be able to function in a workforce that's going to be more and more technologically demanding and require those types of skills. So in addition to, in addition to just the program design, we have also, we operate on a spiral learning design mo educational model. So We've been able to streamline the entry requirements and we provide all of the gen eds as well as the management content within the program itself. So there aren't a huge bunch of entry uh, barriers as, as a way of, of getting in. Once you're in the program, you work through it like one course building on another, one quarter building on another. And we make sure that we are continually finding that learner education by having things like double teaching in uh, team teaching in our gen eds. So we will have a gen ed subject matter expert and then someone like me in the classroom, always making sure on the course, not necessarily in the classroom, always make sure there's learner, learner engagement and learner, you know, everything is contextualized to the workplace environment and the workplace. And then the other, the other part of it is just a bunch of, um, 
uh, you know, instructional supports that we have done. And for this, I have to just give a giant shout out to my, my fellow faculty because we are doing things in a way that certainly we've not done them in Skagit before. We've put in a cap of $50 per textbook per course in the program. So no course will have a, a set of books that will ever cost you more than $50. That is um, you know, something that is a huge hidden barrier for students when you think about that. Um, we are doing things like having common rubrics. So it's the same set of rubrics for all courses. And we can do this because we've tilted or we've made all of our assignments have a very similar structure and the, the, the changes come in the actual content of the assignment. Kind of building on from that, and I am very passionate about my program, so I can talk forever. But uh, on this, but the other, the other, um, the other thing that I am, I'm, I just again, I take my hat off to my faculty is our e-learning e modules all look the same. So students aren't spending time having to navigate where do I find this in a course, where do I have to find that in a course. It's all structured along the same, along the same paths. So what, what that's meaning is that, you know, we're still in early days. I'm only recruiting for my fifth cohort now, and it's a sample size of about 100 odd people who have gone through the program so far. So far. But I'm seeing about 75% completion in two years. So 75% of those who enter the program are finishing in two years. 80% are finishing within three years. And, you know, what that means to kind of build on what Dr. Miller was saying is they're now able to make that contribution to the workforce and to their own families, um, you know, livelihood and prosperity and their own economic empowerment. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we invited you because you're passionate about your program. <laughs> we brought you here to talk all day about this amazing program that you lead. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. And Dr. Miller, the way that Professor Verendra is describing the sort of the changes in the structure to make it more accessible for students is making me even more curious about what CBE and other any other strategies that are in use at South Texas um, look like to, to make these programs really available and accessible for students who might want to enroll. Could you tell us more about that? Yes, yeah, so very similar to Dr. Varendra in terms of everything being uh, very similar course to course so students don't get lost. That's part of CBE. But competency-based education, uh, we are, you know, and I'm a passionate about my program too, like BASEL, Organizational Leadership Program, right? That's the program that I oversee. Uh, it is the largest of all five programs, and it is both traditional online seven week and seven week CBE. So competency based education basically brings in and leverages the prior learning that the student has. As you know, our students are non traditional students. And like Dr. Brenda said, uh, they have other responsibilities. Uh, and so yes, it is this much for education right, but they know that they need that degree to finish and earn, you know, get promoted in their program. So our uh, programs are all based on the three A's. They're affordable because they are only $850 per seven week term for as many courses that you can successfully pass. And there are no cost to books. We are using open education resources so that the students do not have to worry about paying for books. So that's huge, right, for our students because if you remember going to school, you probably paid $200 for a book at one time. And so that, that is gone in our programs. So all of our programs, with the exception, I believe, of nursing at this time, are OER 100%. They're also accessible. What that means, it's 100% online, all of our programs. And in terms of, except for the BSN, <laughs> nursing is not the only one. And so, of course, they're accelerated because competency-based education allows that student to bring in their work for, you know, their work experience and move quickly through the programs. So the students can um, take the core, the lower level, all the way up through their upper levels in their leadership program, uh, all competency-based, which means they will quickly finish their programs. So our students that have um, earned an associate's degree on average will graduate with, within about a year and a half with their baccalaureate degree. And so that is amazing because that means that that's gonna be that much faster that the student's gonna be able to get promoted or move up to a different um, area that they maybe wanna pursue in terms of the workforce or just move on to a graduate program, which by the way, 20% of our students move on to graduate programs that are being successful. So we're very excited about that. And, um, and the demographics are there. It's the same 25 to 34 
uh, age group that you're talking about that are actually attending our programs. And um, most of those programs, like I said, are all CBE with the exception of the BSN. And they are just, and now we have stackables from certificate to associates all the way up to their baccalaureate degrees, all on competency base. So imagine the money, the time that they're going to, you know, reduce and then turn it around so that they can help, you know, their families and change their lives forever. Thank you for sharing. I'm, I'm thinking of, of both of your remarks and just it's amazing what you can do when you build a program with students real lives in mind. Um, so congratulations to both of you on the, the many successes of your students and your programs. Um, so you've each shared a little bit about the students who enroll in your programs or students that you have taught. Um, we know that that 25 to 34 age group is, is really critical. Um, I'm curious, just as you've gotten to know students, what they've told you about why they're doing this. Why did they enroll? Many of, of students who you know are in their early 30s have been out of college for quite some time and decided to come back. So I'm curious if you could share a little bit about who your students are and what they're hoping to um, experience or gain from the Community College Baccalaureate program. Um, Dr. Miller, do you wanna take this one first? Sure. Um, when we think about when you went to the university, what do those classes look like? 100 students, 200 students. And so you really didn't get that one-on-one -on -one that you do at a community college. It just seems that every time that I talk to our students, they all, even if they registered at the university, local university, they'll say, you know what? No, I want to go back to my community college because they're offering the baccalaureate degree, but I'm also gonna get that support that I need that I had when I was there. Everybody's very approachable. They're very friendly. They're helping me right away. I know exactly where to go. I'm not gonna get lost. And so they're looking at that. Plus the fact that it's not going to, uh, the cost is also a big factor in why they return to community colleges, right? And if the degree is accredited the same way, then why not? And so that is important to them um, because they're gonna, they have all that support. Plus in our programs, we actually have an academic coach and the academic coach is crucial in all of our programs, not just for the CBE, but they work with also the traditional online students. So that academic coach works with that student from the moment they enter the program all the way to the graduation to ensure their success. And so they're the liaison, if you will, between the faculty and the student and the student and the faculty member to ensure that they're not going to fall through the cracks. And so that is absolutely important. And it's sometimes, you know, they don't fail because of academics. They might fail because of the personal things that are going on in their lives. And so if they have somebody to share that information with, like their coach, uh, they're gonna, they're building that relationship. And so what they might not tell me as a faculty member, they will share for their academic coach. And so then the coach will let me know. And then I know what, you know, how to better help that student. And so I think that that's huge for our community colleges, something that we offer that perhaps they might not have at a university. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, I'm curious about how that works at Skagit Valley. And I know Professor Miranda, we, we've spoken before like a couple of years ago about your program and you, you have like a really, because it's a cohort model, your students are really tight knit, I think with you and everyone else. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about the students and, and their, their goals and, and who they are. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. So, um, you know, the, 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 the community that we build, um, that, each, that each cohort is building or has built, is something that I think is, is, is mind blowing because it is tight knit. I'm seeing the 24, 25 students um, each year invite each to invite them to each other to weddings, to be godparents, to be, you know, to be engaged with each other. And that has come as a function of being together for two years, right? That same group of students together, you get to know each other really well. In addition to that, because I advise each of my students and each of the faculty are actually also the advisors um, and, and with, with some support from, from someone like Dr. Miller just described, um, we get to know each other really, really well. So I, I am aware of when there is something going on in someone's life that um, is impacting them directly and, and able to make the difference or to make the accommodation or to point the student in the right resources. 
And, and why this has become so, I think, so why this is so important is, is, function, is essentially because as, as we've talked about, we're dealing with students who have been, you know, dealt a very unfortunate hand right now. So, you know, when many of the students are coming from under, are underserved in terms of the economic situation and they're in their life situations, whatever that is. And often this type of engagement is the first sign of kindness that someone has shown them or the first sign of interest that someone has shown them. We go, um, and it's not just me, as I said, it's also the students and the relationships they're building with each other that, that's, that's forcing that, or that's, that's um, driving that. We go, it, you know, the range is, is fantastic within the class itself. You go from about 18, because we can have students who have completed their associate degree while they're in high school in Washington State, to, to 60 plus. And what happens with that is that that creates a learning environment that is phenomenal because the 18 year old is teaching the 60 plus year old the tech stuff and the 60 plus year old is teaching the 18 year old the life skills. And that's the magic. I mean, that's the true magic of, of what we see um, going on. And it's what gives me the, the energy to keep going every single day. Did I, did I answer that question, Ivy? Was there something? Yes, I think you did. And, and what I'm hearing from both of you all together is both in the program structure and in the students who come that these are very people centered opportunities, that the learning happens in relationship and the programs are built with students lives as whole people. Um, and, and that that's meaning the world to those students and, and to their communities. So I really appreciate you both sharing. Um, I have one more question that I'm going to ask the both of you. Um, and then I wanna remind folks who are watching that the Q&A box is open. Um, I do have some time after this. Um, so feel free to drop questions, both about the data presentation and any questions that you may have for our panelists. So uh, I wanna give you a couple minutes while we do this next question to um, enter those. And I will um, ask as many as I can. So my last question for you is this. Um, we have our inventory done for the time being. It's, it's always going to be a moving target with new states, new institutions, new programs. Um, and we know that there are other states considering this policy. We know that there are other institutions wanting to build programs. So if you were talking to state higher education leaders somewhere where they do not allow community colleges to offer any bachelor's programs, but they're interested, what advice would you give them when they're really early in that conversation? What do they need to know that you've kind of learned through experience about why these degrees exist and what their purpose is? Um, I think Professor Brenda, you're on unmute. So I think you volunteered yourself to go first. <laughs> So I mean, I think if I if I were to if I were in a conversation with a with a state legislature on this topic, I think the thing I would try and impress on them is how could you not, right? If we are serious about um, you know improving the the opportunities for everyone out there, how could we not create pathways for people to receive the educational attainment so they're not shut out of life opportunities, so they can benefit from the lower end mortgage interest rate, so they can benefit because, you know, there's that connection between the level of uh, the interest rate you're going to get and the, and the um, you know, the level of education that you have. How could we not? And I think about, uh, the, I would bring in a, a personal example of a student, one particular student of mine, who has just completed his who completed his associate degree a bachelor's degree about two years ago and was just elected to the to city council of the town in which the college lives and you talk about how that could not have been an option for him were he not had he not had this type of you know the the confidence that he got from the program the the camaraderie the the, the you know the platform essentially um and it's really how could you not is my, would be would be the thing not database an emotional plea from the heart yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, Dr. Miller, what would you tell state policymakers about what the CCB is for? I think that if they look at the number of students that have some college credit or no credit in their state, that that is a big drive because there's a lot of students out there with so many credits and no degree. And so these programs have been, uh, at least in our area, have been developed to for that purpose, to be able to accept all the credits that are out there that they've had um, for to accept um, up to 90 of those credits into our programs. So for example, if you earn an associate's degree in a community college and you transfer over to a university, 
you're not going to get much out of that transfer, right? The student's going to learn, lose many credits and that process. And so in a community college, we don't. We will, we will take those credits and then whatever is pending is what the student will take to continue on and finish that baccalaureate degree. And so that's important because imagine if you spent all that time and resources to earn that associate's degree, or maybe you just, life happens uh, to the student as many of us have, you know, all you have to do is look at COVID and see what happened there and take all those students that say, okay, I, I have some credits, but what do I do? Where do I go? Where I don't have to start from day one and so these programs, these baccalaureate degrees are huge. They're so important to those students in terms of finishing that degree, uh, getting that self-confidence that they gain after they earn it, that they can do anything. If they can do this, they can do anything. And so that's important. And not only in terms of self um, validity, if you will, but also the economic impact that our students are you know, generating because they've earned their baccalaureate degrees. So it's, that's what I would tell the politicians. And we are wanting, we are already asking for more than just the five, but we, they have said no right now, but I'm hoping that at some point they will allow us because they can see the success. It's in the data. All they have to do is look at the data that in within, at least within Texas, what we've generated that will help them make a decision in their states. Thank you so much for that. Um, so before I look at the questions, it's occurred to me that um, there may be things that you wanted to share that we didn't get to. So I just want to give each of you an opportunity. You know, what, what did I miss in my questions? Is there anything else that you would like to share? And I'll just allow you to come off mute if you have anything else that you would like to share. I'm not going to, I'm not going to call on people for this one. Well, one of the yeah. things that I did forget to mention, Ivy, is in our CBE programs, I did mention that right there, $850, they carry a special tuition for our students there, uh, no books, no cost in the books. But what I didn't mention was the fact that uh, the student for that same $850 can actually take as many courses as they can successfully pass within those seven weeks. So imagine if you have a student that, um, I, for example, I had one that took time off of work, he took at least three or four weeks off of work to finish his upper levels. So he actually finished eight courses in seven weeks. So that obviously that's an anomaly, right? But it does happen with competency base. Um, and now, so now right now he's finishing his last two. So in two terms, $1,700 later, he's got his, ad, he's, he's gonna be earning his baccalaureate degree. That's what competency based education does for somebody with prior learning work experience that can bring it into your courses, leverage that, and why do you have to sit in a class for 16 weeks? Oh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Congratulations to your student ahead of time. That's really wonderful. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit envious of Dr. Miller's competency-based um, education, the model that's there, because I think that is just one of the most fantastic things that could happen in terms of recognizing and honoring the life experience that people bring to the, bring to, to, to the educational environment. I think the, the one other thing that I would just kind of point out is the, the type of institutional support um, that, uh, that certainly I've enjoyed uh, to be able to do some of the things I've been able to do. And, you know, I've been blessed that I have some phenomenal executive deans that I work with who have provided me with the air cover as I've broken eggs when I've been making my omelet. You know, a college president who believes in the power of the community college baccalaureate and has been willing to put resourcing behind it. And I think that is such an important thing when you can have faculty and administration coming together to you can harness the power of something that is really, truly magnificent and then make a difference to to um, to people's lives. Um, just, it's been a magical partnership. Thank you so much. All right, let me just real quick, I'm gonna open the spreadsheet of questions and see what we've got here. Um, let me ask first, we've got a question about course scheduling. Um, we got a question that said, any advice regarding course scheduling, any consideration of the block model of course scheduling to make them more accessible to adult and working learners? Have either of you done block scheduling um, or anything like that? Do you have advice for folks? I mean, with the competency-based education, that's 
a little different. Maybe Professor Rurinda, do you have any thoughts about how you scheduled the in-person part of your hybrid programs? Yeah, I mean, we when we were doing in-person learning, we were just one day a week and we had three classes and students were asked to come to campus. It was limited contact time. It was only 90 minutes per class, but it was done one day a week, recognizing that that would help students to plan their lives, right? And that is the number one thing. As you think about, you know, how you set up the schedules, think about how uh, it is possible that you're not requiring multiple trips to, ca to campus. You're also helping students to manage childcare. You're helping students to manage, you know, elder care, find child, whatever the, the things that you're juggling. And, and finding that our advisory committee was phenomenal with helping, giving some, some input from an employer perspective is this is when they could, you know, afford to have people not be present at work. And, and that was a really big, um, big resource in that. The one other thing that's linked to block scheduling, and, and this is sometimes overlooked when we think about instruction, is how you can synchronize due dates for assignments. So we've actually moved to now we have a single assignment due date of Sundays. Um, and what that means is that the students have to plan ahead to get the work done and to schedule it in, but it what works for them. And that kind of goes with the block scheduling as well. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is predictability is key. Yeah. Um, and with the seven week terms, you're always going to turn over at that time, build it in your life where you want. Um, I, I can see the value in both of those models for students to be able to fit this into the many roles that they have. Um, I'm, I'm going to flag for our uh, data presenters that we got a bunch of questions about the data. So I, I may call on you in just a moment to uh, respond to some of these. Let me just see what else we've got here. Um, so. Let's talk about this question here. Do you think the field has leveled off and most remaining states will not move in this direction? Um, I might pass the answer to the, I, I might call on uh, Dr. Bragg to take that one if you would like. Um, I'm happy to offer some comments as well, but want to give you an opportunity. Um, my answer is no. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've um, hit some sort of roadblock. I, I do think there's, um, you know, you might be familiar with the idea of um, sort of policy borrowing. And I think what we saw in the West is a lot of states were learning from one another and they were sharing in, in that region of the country, um, as we often do in, in our country, we share uh, regionally. But uh, we, we're not going to name states today that um, are in deliberation, but we know of at least two states that have had legislative activity, um, pushed off this decision, but have appointed task force uh, forces to look at it. So I, I do think it's still a very, very active um, higher ed policy issue. Yeah, I will, um, just to respond to this question, I. I'm multitasking too much right now, but I will, uh, I'll tweet out a link to a blog post that we wrote a few weeks ago about a 2021 legislative roundup on community college baccalaureates because there were so many bills. Um, and as I think, as we heard in the, the data presentation, you know, Arizona has just passed their legislation. Um, just this week, they published in a few news stories, a list of programs that they're thinking about going for, um, which was, there were seven programs on that list, which is quite a lot for a, a new institution. So that's really exciting. So on an institutional level, that's one thing. Um, but we saw California this year also pass a bill that expanded authorization beyond what they had before, which was 15 institutions with one pilot program per institution. And now they've removed those caps, removed the pilot status. There's still a limit on the number of programs that they will be able to approve per year. Um, 30 total per year is, is the limit, but any college could propose a program and theoretically do that. So even in some states where it's already authorized, it could grow. So um, yeah, I think there's there's more state policy to come. Um, and I will I will tweet that blog post out. Um, so if, if you are on the Twitterverse, you can see it there. Um, let me pull up one more question that had to do um, a bit with the data. Do you have examples of what falls in the other and unknown category from that last slide? Um, because there were a lot in some of the older states. Um, Dr. Bragg, do you want to take that one too? And then I'll chime in as needed. I will. I'll let, um, I'm going to queue up Tim Harmon, though, who, who uh, has really been managing 
as far there it is really a vast array <laughs> Um, you know, there's everything from culinary arts to um, tourism to, um, gosh, I can't even think, you know, it sort of runs the gamut of what you would expect, you know, the rest of the higher ed curriculum to look like. Um, so there is a, most of it is pretty workforce connected. Um, but it is quite a wide range. And I see Tim's online, so I'm going to step back and let him comment. So, the, so Ivy, is the question about uh, degree types? Or? Oh, it's on the last slide where there's that um, unknown and other category where it's the 100% it's the bar charts for the four or the five most common conferring states and the national data. So it was like STEM, business, education, and then there's that and nursing and health. And then there's that piece at the top that's unknown or other. And folks are wanting to know what the unknown and other is. Oh, okay. So I think that the focus there is on um, program categories, right? Yeah, there, and right. yeah, it is quite a collection of, um, of, of CIP codes. I mean, it really covers the gamut. I mean, I can, uh, maybe pull up uh, to give you some examples of what we're talking about here, but um, it's- Human uh, services is another area that I think has really emerged probably related to uh, the pandemic as well. So we do see a number of public administration, public policy, human services, behavioral sciences, um, that is an, unex I would, my research goes back many, many years, and that is an area I, I didn't anticipate emerging. Um, we certainly see those programs in Washington and Florida, and now we're seeing them elsewhere as well. Right, and um, yeah, and I think there's, there are programs that, you know, if we, we're taking a closer look, we might categorize, I mean, differently, but I think that that's what we, you know, we have a lot of different, uh, I mentioned the degree categories earlier there. I know there's a lot of uh, sort of obscure, frankly, to me, degrees that are, that were being offered uh, in the, uh, the, we have like Bachelor of Science degrees in computer science, but that's, that's a category that's already, that's already shown there. Um, sustainability studies, uh, the you know geospatial design, uh, our architecture, saw water, you know some of them are kind of intersect with the engineering category, but maybe not directly because they're more you know, like sort of environmental or biological science categories. So there's just a, a wide range of of um, of possibilities there, and, and it is a lot of programs. You're right. Yeah, I think there was a lot of, there were a lot of ag programs that only a couple of them were on like the STEM list of six digit zip codes that we were using. So, so there are a bunch of ag programs in there too, which I think one could argue are STEM programs, but we're going to stick, we're going to stick to the list and stick to the standards that we've got. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that's emerging and interesting too, is I think a number of the programs really um, cut across, they're interdisciplinary. So you'll see, because jobs are changing and the workforce is changing, and there's an expectation that people will be able to do, you say, ag, water, and sustainability, and public policy. So they, they bring together, um, you know, I think in their efforts to meet local workforce needs, they're working with employers to say, what is that? What is that optimal mix of skills and competencies that our students need? in order to serve uh, our community. And to me, that is one of the most exciting aspects because they're, they're really, some of them are really quite creative um, and in producing graduates that are, are really doing some amazing things. So that's important. And also, I mean, we uh, don't have complete coverage, I think on CIP coding, as I recall. So we still we have a few that are that we don't we don't know. Right? I think it's only so, like three three to five at the bottom that didn't yeah, have. Yeah, so that it's we not very many. But yeah, those are mostly other things, not unknown. 
Yeah. All right. I have one more question before we call it a day. Um, and um, that is, if we change our understanding of the categorization of institutions where it's not as strictly two year, four year, and we acknowledge some of the blurring that's happening, is that going to be detrimental to community colleges state funding? Uh, what, what, is, what are the funding implications for any shift in categorization that happens? Um, Dr. Bragg, I'm going to throw that question to you. And Dr. Turk, I welcome your thoughts as well. Really? Let's, let's anyway, let it's open, it's a free call. It's open to anybody. That. I know it's above my pay grade. <laughs> so, I mean, inherent in that question, right, is the discussion of performance-based funding models and the various different equations and models that are out there at states. And so nothing I'm going to be able to say right now is going to wave a magic wand and necessarily adjust it for all of those different models. But, um, you know, the, the contrary, the other side of that argument is uh, when I was working in D.C., the number of times I would field calls from people that asked me, why are there fewer community colleges each year? Uh, with this great concern that suddenly we were having a rash of closings of community colleges. Mm -hmm. And the explanation that I had to give them is, oh no, they're just being counted in the four-year institution group. And so I use that as the example to say that when we completely remove any discussion of the mission and purpose of the organizations and focus solely on what degrees that they award, you're missing the main points of the institution. And, and so that, that's what can happen when you have those kinds of situations. So, I mean, I think, you know, for the most part, states um, that uh, states with performance-based funding that have community colleges that offer baccalaureate degrees as well as associate degrees, there are elements of the, of the models themselves of the equations that an award for the different missions essentially of the community college. And so they're not necessarily being held to the exact same standards across um, their associate degree completions and certificate completions and things like that as they would be their bachelor's degree completions like there's some bifurcation that can occur um, in, in those pro in those programs as well but I think the, la the larger point is that really we really should be thinking a little bit more critically I, I think about higher education in, in general um, and how we talk about institutions and how we design these kinds of systems because like I said that the default of whatever your highest degree level is and this kind of old, really antiquated system of everything that it means to be a four-year institution, that's gone out the window now. And Ivy, not to geek out too much on the, the data stuff, but that's it what we're be, here for. Okay. The, it would be cool to have uh, rather to sort of abandon these nominal categorizations entirely and have a more ratio view of the mix of the institutional conferrals by degree type, for instance, and that might give us a more nuanced, well, it definitely would give us a more nuanced picture of what's actually happening out there and how it's changing over time, which is Jonathan's point about what are we losing colleges? No, we're not. We're just changing what they do a little bit. And sometimes it's just a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Well, I want to thank everyone here so much for this amazing event. Um, we're really grateful for all of your time, for sharing your experiences, your expertise. Um, we really, really appreciate all of you. And we're very grateful to everyone who attended today. Um, our paper is available. I will tweet that as well. Um, I'm not very active on Twitter, but I will tweet several things out for the folks who are here to be able to access the materials easily. Um, really appreciate you all and wish you a great afternoon and a great rest of the week. So take good care. Thanks. Thank you, Ivy. Thank Thanks. you, Ivy. See ya.